On the eve of Prince Harry's wedding to Meghan Markle, we look back at his extraordinary life. You know, Harry hasn't had it easy. You know, he's had one hell of a journey. When he was growing up, the media was treating the family as if it was a soap opera. What a strange and weird childhood that must have been. This is the story of how Harry's life has been shaped by royal events across the past four decades, both joyous and tragic. The great romance that everyone saw, it didn't reflect reality. It was a very, very affecting moment when you saw the words mummy on the envelope. The woman your mother hated suddenly becomes your stepmother. Harry helped William get through that day, no doubt. And now it'd be time for William to return the favor. Hearing from those who know him best. He was a prankster. He was a joker, just a bit like his mother, really. I remember them coming into the kitchen, and, and I was completely at a loss for words. We mark Harry's transformation from teenage tearaway. He just leant forward and he just kissed me. And I just thought, what on earth did you do that for? To a modern prince for modern times. He's just the golden ticket in the pocket of the British monarchy. How he's lived his life has changed the perception for the royal family to realize that actually you've got to engage with the public. He can reach parts of the public that people like Prince Charles and Prince William can't reach. He's the Heineken prince. This is Prince Harry's story. Harry turned around and said, I won't be King William, well, therefore I can do what I like. This was a four or five year old. So they knew exactly who they were and what their destiny was. As a new chapter begins in royal history, hip, hip, hooray! It's a boy! It was at this same London hospital 34 years ago that Prince Harry was born. Prince Henry made his first public appearance just after half past two. But he'll be known, say his parents, as Harry. When I first heard the name, I didn't like it at all, but I've said it about 20 times now, and I'm quite getting used to it. From that day onwards, Harry's life would be played out in front of a media circus. The trade-off for a royal life of palaces and privilege. As a consequence, his mother was determined to make his and his brother's lives as normal as she could. If you could find some sort of normality of a family inside a royal palace, th this is what it was. And William and, and, and Harry were very much encouraged to mix with the butlers, mix with the chefs, the chauffeurs, the ladies in waiting, the cleaners. And brought up in the traditional way with the governess or the nanny, she wanted to be a hands on parent. Diana made that stand of actually the first royal to actually take their children to school, not just on the opening day, but on a regular basis. This was her idea of breaking away from royal tradition. It was on those school runs that Harry first engaged with the waiting press pack. What happened, photographers, in order to get a reaction, would stick their tongue out. And that would attract a four-year-old to copy him. And that's why he stuck his tongue out. And he did it fairly regularly. He thought it was very funny. And that mischievous streak was just as evident at home. Harry was four when I started cooking for the family, and 15 when I left. And uh, I have very vivid memories of being in the kitchen at Kensington Palace. I remember hearing very fast, scampering children's footsteps as Harry tore up on the landing and then flew down the stairs towards the kitchen. And uh, on more than one occasion, Harry was trying to escape from his nanny. Quick, help, help, I need to hide. So there were some low-down cupboards, so it was very quick to scoop Harry in and, and close the door. Um, he didn't always give himself away with his giggles. He was a prankster. Um, you know, he was a joker, just a bit like his mother, really. Diana would always play with the children. She would be on her hands and knees playing piggybacks and cuddling William and Harry, and it was just wonderful times. I remember one particular day running a bath, and I went back to my office room and came back, and there's this bath now bright red. And I think, Christ, you know, what is this? And of course, Harry had, had seen me running a bath, gone down to the kitchen, asked the chef, Ken's having a bath, have you got anything I put in the bath? Well, you know, the chefs are very much into this game as well, so they give Harry a, a bottle of red cochineal. And of course, he empties the whole contents of the bath, because then his mother comes out and finds all this. And that's what it was. 
It was great fun. I remember particularly weekends at Highgrove and um, there was quite a lot of rough and tumble and I think Prince Charles and the boys definitely enjoyed the odd pillow fight and a good, good bit of rough and tumble. Despite best intentions, there was little hope the boys could ever grow up in a normal environment. I remember a, a journey with William and Harry. They were arguing with the nanny sat in the middle and Diana was driving saying, shut up, both of you. And as Harry turned around and, and said, well, I can do what I like because, you know, I won't be King William, well, therefore I can do what I like. This was a, from a four or five-year-old, so they knew exactly who they were and what their destiny was. Their destinies had been set years before, when with the eyes and hopes of the world on them, Charles and Diana married in St Paul's Cathedral in 1981. That was probably the biggest audience on television that there had ever been. The adoring crowds didn't know then that they were witnessing a marriage based more on convenience than love. This was, in a sense, the last gasp of the old way of royal marriages, where the bride was effectively selected for her seeming suitability as a broodmare and not because of any real attachment felt between the two people. But for the nation, the royal celebrations came at a perfect time. 1981 comes at the end of this long period of extended crisis, really, in Britain. If you've had under strikes, power cuts, unemployment shooting up, you have people fighting in the streets, violence on the football terraces. It's just one incident after another. That's why the royal wedding in 1981 feels like such a, a break from the story. It's good, it's great, isn't it? Cheers everybody up. We all want to believe in fairy tales. So as a little girl, I remember I was in my night watching that wedding on television, and it was the most enchanting thing. With the weight of the country's expectations on her shoulders, Diana, the unknown kindergarten teacher, became an instant global icon. And that was the beginning, I think, of the, the love affair. But away from the public smiles, issues soon developed at home, with family life suffering as a result. The relationship between Charles and Diana was made very problematic by the fact that Diana was this megastar. Everyone became obsessed with her. And that was very difficult for Charles. I'm the heir, I'm the future king, and yet Diana got all this attention. As Diana's profile grew, so did the cracks in the marriage. Publicly, they were an absolute dynamic duo. But privately, their lives were bitterly unhappy. I can remember the relationship falling apart in, in slow motion. At the heart of this, there were two very, very young boys. And one can only imagine what they were going through. What a strange and weird childhood that must have been. Diana hid it quite well from the children because it wasn't just about her, it was about how the children are going to be affected. It was very sad. But the couple couldn't hide their unhappiness forever. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. On the 9th of December, 1992, the separation was finally sealed. William Harry's parents would have had an impact. And as a child, you want your parents to stay together and be that unit. And sometimes they get stuck between two warring parents. And all those emotions can take their toll on a child, but sometimes, not straight away, these things can manifest themselves over a longer period of time. The separation marked the end of a difficult year for the entire monarchy. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. It started with the separation of Andrew and, and Fergie. It was the year that Anne and Mark Phillips also divorced. And to have Windsor Castle engulfed by flames was quite something. Every family has its problems. And the royal family went through a, a, a crisis then. All the wheels seemed to be coming off. The War of the Waleses and the bitterness that existed between them uh, characterised the monarchy of the early 1990s. The media was treating the family as if it was a soap opera, and I think we were all lapping it up as if it was a soap opera, forgetting that these were real people with real feelings and lives. 
and the damage that all of this was doing to the children. After so many interviews that they'd given, uh, so many stories appearing which were negative, not just to themselves, but to the monarchy, the Queen intervened and requested that they uh, end this feud and divorce. On the 28th of August, 1996, the Queen would get her wish. Charles would become the first heir to the throne in history to divorce. But there was an even greater event to come that would shape Harry's life forever. Just to confirm the news that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died in a car accident in Paris, which also killed her companion, Dodie Fired. On the 31st of August, 1997, Prince Harry and his brother William were with their father on holiday in Scotland. They were both sound asleep when tragedy struck. Their mother, Diana, had died in a car crash in Paris. Prince Charles was just in an agony. He went into their bedrooms and, and removed radios, televisions, anything that would enable them to hear the news from somebody else and he broke the news to them in the morning. Charles is a caring man, he's a very caring man, and, and he had to protect the boys as much. Closed doors. But 500 miles away in London, the nation witnessed an unprecedented public display of emotion. Everybody was coming to pour their grief and show their appreciation to Diana. I was straight up to Kensington and put my flowers by the gate and pay my respects because she meant something me and yeah I, I cried but while the nation openly mourned diana there was a vocal and unprecedented demand for the royal family to return to london the queen wants to remain in balmoral because above all she was trying to protect the boys it was interpreted as the week wore on as the queen being aloof not getting it not caring even and that really built people needed someone to blame because they were so devastated by the loss of Princess Diana and almost kind of uncomprehending that, that her death could have happened. The wave of anger against the royal family after Diana died was absolutely extraordinary. You see the biggest dip in royal popularity that there has been. It's amazing to look back now and see these incredibly, usually very royalist newspapers saying, show us you care, Mom. Come to London. We are here alone. Into this vacuum stepped a newly elected prime minister. She was the people's princess, and that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. Tony Blair was getting all the attention. As a consequence, the royal family rather went down in popularity. When the politicians are very popular, the royal family tend to go down. And when the politicians are very unpopular, the royal family go up. You do to see the seesawing. The grief-stricken family, stung by the criticism, made their way to London. I was in London on the day that Prince Charles and William and Harry came down from Scotland and came back to St James's Palace. And I remember vividly Harry coming into the kitchen and jumping up on the seat by the window and just looking at this little boy, wondering how he would even begin to process all that he was seeing and everything that was being thrown at him. But duty demanded Harry do more than just look at the crowds. Charles, William and Harry went to Kensington Palace and they looked at the bouquets that had been left there and the emotion on their faces, you couldn't mistake it. They were devastated, they were heartbroken. Looking back on it now, I think it was probably rather cruel that they were brought back down to London and had to look at all those flowers, all these people sort of reaching out to touch them. William, William. William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Confusing, because he was having to absorb other people's pain, yet perhaps repress his own. I think that must have been some of the hardest hours and days and minutes of their, of their whole lives. In front of a watching world, William, aged just 15, Harry, still only 12, had to bury them 
Harper in step with royal protocol. What could be more awful? And you've been told by your father and your grandfather, you don't look to the side, you walk in step with me, you don't cry, you walk. I mean, that is brutal. There's an old saying in royal circles, don't wear private grief on a public sleeve, and they didn't. They were probably screaming inside and hurting inside, but they carried that off with such dignity that people even today don't understand how did they do it. I was at Highgrove that evening when they came back from the funeral, and uh, I remember them coming into the kitchen, and, and I was completely at a loss for words. What on, what on earth do you say? My instinct when I first saw them was to want to give them a hug, but it just didn't seem appropriate. We didn't want to cross any boundaries. It was very difficult. You just wanted to be there to support them in any way that you could. The day of the funeral is the day that, that all of us remember, but it's all the days and weeks and months after that of learning to live a life without their mother, who played such a massive part in their lives. Harry's talked about the fact that no one should ever have made a child do that. <laughs> you can only agree. The emotions that he was feeling inside that day when he followed his mother's coffin stayed buried there for, for two decades to come. Harry turned to his father and brother for support, particularly to William. I think when they were growing up, because of the unhappiness within the family, like so often happens, siblings cling together for mutual support. And then after their mother died, again, they clung together. And the two boys were finally awarded some protection from the media during their time at Eden. Following the death of Princess Diana, there was an agreement with the press uh, and the palace that whilst they were in full-time education, the press would leave them alone. Harry was 13 when he became a boarder at the exclusive school. There's all kinds of hormonal changes going on, but add another layer for Harry, and you've got somebody who is also grief-stricken, saying, where do I belong? Who am I? How do I feel about me? He went public with his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla was regarded as the woman who had ruptured the fairy tale union of Prince Charles and Diana, or had doomed it from the start by simply being, as Prince Stunner put it, the third person in their marriage. Harry might have been conflicted about that. I mean, on the one hand, he may have wanted his father to be really happy. On the other hand, he may have had feelings like a lot of kids have, you know, you're replacing my mum, you're not my mum, and getting his head around that. And I think that's a process, an emotional process that takes time. It was during this time that Harry's teenage problems really began to take root. Harry took to drink in a very big way. I think it was a form of self-medication. He'd had a rough time. An underage Harry became a regular at the Rattlebone Inn, a pub near his father's home at Highgrove. Prince Harry and Prince William used to come in there quite a bit when we used to play in there. We got to know Harry reasonably well. One of the songs he particularly liked was uh, Rockin' All Over the World. He got up and sang that one with us a couple of times. There was one night, I remember, I was halfway through a song and Harry came and stood right in front of my microphone. And he just leant forward and he just kissed me. And I just thought, what on earth did you do that for? But, but that was just a little, little bit about, <laughs> you know, who he was. But the good times were about to come to an end. The prince is said to have smoked cannabis in this outhouse, known locally as the Den. And at one stage, he was barred from the pub for allegedly swearing at a French chef during a fight. The press blackout was over. Harry was front page news. I do wonder who was there at the time for Harry to give him that structure and those boundaries. Was it Prince Charles? Was it the Queen? Was it the private secretary? Who was there at the time to say, no, Harry, you've gone too far? Harry finished his A-levels and left Eton aged 18. There were real worries. Harry could have gone off the rails completely and just taken solace in a bottle and drugs or whatever. Or he could have just disappeared from the royal scene. In fact...
he has huge empathy, which she also had. The experience would make a lasting impression on the prince, and he would return in later years to set up the Centre Bali charity, a commitment that would impress those who would work alongside him. I went back with him a couple of years ago, watching him in that space and engaging with those kids. I can say wholeheartedly, observing and listening to Harry when he's out there in that space, it is completely selfless. Harry's efforts would go on to help raise millions of pounds for young people affected by HIV. But in 2004, after he returned from his first visit to Lesotho, he found the press were waiting for him. Any time he went out, any time he went to a club, any time he dressed inappropriately or had too much to drink, there well, that ticked the box. That is party, Harry. They would be waiting for him at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he'd had a drink or five. Then they would chase him in their cars. He had a rough time, actually. He saw these photographers quite understandably as the type of people that had harassed his mother and the, the type of people that had probably led to her death. And worse was to come when Harry was pictured wearing a swastika as part of a fancy dress outfit. All of a sudden, this young lad who, for a laugh, dressed in a Nazi outfit at a party, was being pilloried. And even MPs saying, you know, is he fit to join the army is he fit to be a royal this is the story of prince harry from lost child to one of britain's greatest assets told through extraordinary events that transformed both his life and the british monarchy and in 2005 aged 20 when his life was at a crossroads another momentous royal event would occur for harry charles and camilla's wedding was very far from a typical royal wedding in that they turned up together to Windsor Guildhall to have a registry office marriage. I think there were about 28 guests, and it was very low-key. The union represented a constitutional revolution, as it was the first time in history a divorced heir to the throne would remarry. It's a sign of how far the royal family have come and how far as we as a nation have come, that, no, that divorce is no longer a dirty word. Remember, when King Edward VIII wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, who was twice divorced with her husband's living, uh, he was forced to abdicate. The Queen did, by this point, welcome this marriage. She didn't attend the civil ceremony, but she did attend the blessing in St George's Chapel, the place where Harry and Meghan will marry. The ceremony may have been low-key, but the wedding represented a huge shift in public opinion. Beyond the pale. But relatively quickly, you know, it's only eight years. They're kind of dragged it round and they can kind of get married without kind of people looting and pillaging on the street. And the fact that William and Harry endorsed the union underlined this transformation even further. It was on their faces that they absolutely approved of this wedding. They were so happy for their father because they love their father and they like him to be happy. Maybe it's a tribute to the relationship between Charles and William and Harry that they've got there, they've worked it out. The marriage of Charles and Camilla paved the way for the marriage of Harry and Meghan. Love really was a valid criterion for royal marriages. It shows how far the royal family have come. But with his father newly married, now more than ever, Harry needed to find somewhere he belonged. In May 2005, Harry entered Sandhurst Military Academy. That's where Harry became a regular person. He was just Harry to everybody else. And that was really what he did, that semblance of normality. The army saved Harry. You learn a lot of skills. You learn authority, uh, leadership, communication skills. It would have taught him everything. And you can see that coming through him as an adult now. He grew up very quickly. And that was lovely to see. He went from that cheeky, mischievous boy to being a man. After 44 gruelling weeks of training, Harry was now an army officer. The graduating parade at Sandhurst is in front of the sovereign, so she always witnesses the graduating parade. But this time it was different because Harry, as the graduating soldier, couldn't help himself but really show his joy at being out there graduating in front of his grandma. The Sandhurst experience had given Harry the confidence he'd been lacking. He was now keen to join his regiment on the front line. The last thing I want to do is have my soldiers sent away to Iraq or wherever like that and 
to be held back home, twiddling my thumbs, thinking, well, what about David? What about Derek? You know? <laughs> Clearly, he wanted to deploy on operations. Uh, I wanted him to go on operations. After all, he trained for that. Plans were made in 2006 for Harry to travel to Iraq with his regiment, but then news of his deployment leaked. As a result of that, there was some propaganda put out by insurgents that they put a bounty on the prince's head. There are a number of specific threats of a varied nature, some reported and some not reported, specifically aimed at Prince Harry. We came to the conclusion that the risks weren't worth running and that he wouldn't deploy, which, of course, hugely upset Prince Harry at the time. Frustrated he couldn't join his fellow comrades. If you don't let me go and serve on the front line with my men, with the guys I'm training with, I'm not going to hang about. The problem that I had was to find a method by which he could deploy, which was what led to this rather extraordinary meeting, which I convened in the Ministry of Defence, inviting the editors of most of the major media outlets. A bold and ambitious plan was hatched. Harry would travel to Afghanistan, and the British press would keep the news under wraps. When the agreement was made that we wouldn't report on Harry, um, I don't think there was a journalist that thought it would work. It was certainly a gamble, um, because it, it, it could have leaked. Harry travelled with his regiment as Captain Wales to the front line without special privilege. Photographer John Stilwell was one of the select few who would find themselves in the thick of the action alongside the Prince. Everyone said to me, he's going to be 34 underground. They won't chance him outside. As soon as we got to Kandahar, we told we're going down to the front line. Three, four hundred yards from the enemy, from the Taliban. I was looking around thinking, if someone recognises him, a sniper, they could take him out quite easily. No, he was in danger. He was in danger. Against all odds, the media blackout was holding. And back home, with Harry missing from royal duties, his family were doing their bit to keep the secret safe. We'd had the Queen doing her Christmas message, talking about all the troops out in Afghanistan and around the world, but she never wasn't able to mention, oh, and by the way, and my grandson, Prince Harry, is there too. And it must have been very difficult for Prince Charles when he was going around meeting the different soldiers and regiments and them all talking about Afghanistan, and he not say, well, actually, yeah, I know, I've, I've had letters and phone calls from my son. He's on the front line too. But there was one very special message from home. He'd had a phone call from Prince William saying that Mum would be very proud of him, which I think, you know, meant a lot to him. While his family were tucking into their Christmas dinner, Harry was busy forging a lasting relationship with the Gurkha Regiment, led by Major Pun. Prince Harry interacted very easily with the boys. It was very popular amongst the uh, Gurkhas. It's bizarre. You, I'm out here now. I haven't really had a shower for four days. I haven't washed my clothes for a week, and everything seems completely normal. <laughs> Thousands of miles from home, Harry had found a sense of belonging. We sleep together, we train together, we fight it together, you know. Um, and about, we all always grown up as a one big family to look after each other. Prince Harry became one of us. At uh, Christmas dinner, Prince Harry, he had a good curry. He could have easily got leave of absence, but no, he was there on Christmas Day while the Queen talked to the nation and we all ate our turkey. Eat but the blackout didn't last. The foreign media broke the news, and Harry was immediately pulled out. Prince Harry was fairly down about his own circumstances, and I can recall putting a gin and tonic in his hand, and he said, the trouble is, I'm, I'm not like a normal young man. Uh, and one knew exactly what he meant. He, he couldn't do what everybody else did. The experience did signal a thawing of troubled relations between Harry and Fleet Street's finest. Thank you to all the British media for um, keeping, their, keeping their mouths shut. And, and I know for a fact that there was stuff they did behind the scenes to stop stuff from coming out, which was massively uh, um, kind of them. Despite his frustration, Harry was determined to find a way back to the front line, this time training as an Apache helicopter pilot. He was the top student on his course. He was the top gun on his course. Well done him. This was a fantastic boost to Harry's confidence. For the first time, he discovered there was something that he could do better than anybody else. That was the real turning point for Harry. In 2011, an event would occur where the world would see firsthand how much Harry had changed. His brother William would marry Kate Middleton, and the young prince would be his best man. The celebrations couldn't have come at a better time. It's nice to see tomorrow all over again.
in 2011, we had been through this very deep recession after the financial crisis. There was a sense, I think, Britain really needs a bit of a tonic. What better boost for the nation than seeing a middle-class girl from Berkshire marrying the future king? Kate wasn't from the aristocracy. She and William fell in love, you know, and, and we are of a time, we're in a generation where that means something. The fact that Prince William didn't marry a sort of European princess, but married Berkshire Rose, Kate Middleton, showed the actors in the royal family are now autonomous. Our royals would never submit to an arranged marriage with some horse-faced German princess anymore. On this grand stage, Harry would come into his own. There was a great moment where we saw Prince William and Prince Harry standing together, straightening themselves, knowing that the bridal party had arrived. Harry, looking so dashing in his uniform, Harry helped William get through that day, no doubt. Harry was able to just calm him down, smile. Harry's transformation from clown prince to royal asset was almost complete. And in 2014, he embarked on a new venture. Harry's made no secret of the fact that he really wants to champion wounded. Serving in Afghanistan, Harry had been inspired on a return flight home to the UK. There were two very, very badly wounded soldiers that had lost limbs being flown back in the same military aeroplane. And Harry, quite poignantly, said, I'm not a hero. Those guys are the real heroes. I think that had a very profound effect on him as an individual, as a human being. He wanted to do something to address that. Um, and his response to that was the Invictus Games. The Games are an international multi-sports event set up to inspire Harry's wounded comrades and challenge preconceptions about disability. Get out there, meet these guys, listen to their stories, and in some cases, in many cases, learn from them. It comes from, from him. He is the driving force behind it. It's, it's his vision that we're delivering. Fame can be a wonderful thing. If you, It's like a superpower if you use it well. Harry has realized, I've got this power, I'm going to use it well. For people who feel a bit marginalised, for people who feel like they're not worth very much, um, to have somebody as, as prominent as Harry just come and shake their hand and say, how are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's just great. Just like his mother, Harry was adopting a more relaxed style of royal conduct, and people loved it. Some events, he was in the crowd <laughs> getting his popcorn stolen. <laughs> Other events, he was talking to the competitors behind the scenes, talking to the friends and family, talking to the volunteers. Just uh, everything doing everything. <laughs> in 2015, after 10 years in uniform, Prince Harry left the army. He had established himself on the world stage, but his private life was another matter. I think the reason Harry's previous girlfriends haven't worked, notably uh, Chelsea Davy, Cressida Bonas, they simply couldn't handle the press intrusion. Other girlfriends that he's had haven't been able to cope with the fact, and Harry hasn't been able to cope with the fact that there's that baggage, you know. Harry's very protective, um, uh, particularly of his girlfriends. And for those who'd seen him grow up, the prince's loneliness was hard to bear. I think it must have been really tough, because I'm sure there were some who he was very fond of, but perhaps the life wasn't really going to suit them. It was a worry, I think, that Harry was going to find someone who was going to be able to deal with all that pressure. With his brother settling down and starting a family, attention turned to who Harry would choose. But in October 2016, speculation began when he started dating one Meghan Markle. After a troubled journey through four decades, three weddings and a funeral, Prince Harry had transformed from little lost boy to war hero and seemed to grow into his royal role. Harry's been on quite the emotional journey. He feels like he's come of age. He's gone before him now because we can see that he's always been Prince Harry. He's just like any young man finding his way in the world. Prince Harry met Meghan Markle on a blind date in London in the summer of 2016. I think we'd all predicted another beautiful willowy blonde from the home counties. She's smart, she's independent, she's been successful in her own right. I love the fact that she's American, that she 
divorced, that she's from a broken home. She's mixed heritage, African heritage. She is a black woman. <laughs> and she's absolutely right for the times. But media fascination with the new relationship soon crossed the line. When the news broke that Prince Harry was dating this biracial American actress who was also divorced, there was a feeding frenzy. The press were climbing into Meghan's house. They were camped on her lawn. They were following her. It was deeply unpleasant. Meghan had been the victim of some of the most horrendous racist attacks. The trolls on social media had been vicious. Fearing another relationship could be ruined by media intrusion, Harry was forced into an unprecedented move, demanding the press pack back off. Harry's statement from Kensington Palace about press intrusion and press coverage of Meghan Markle was impressive. The statement says some reporting has crossed the line with abuse and harassment with racial overtones. He wants to protect this woman who he's in love with. Um, very sadly, in his own life experience, he's seen uh, the way his mother, you know, how was hounded over the years. You could argue that that's made him oversensitive, but at the same time, you could argue, why wouldn't he step up for the woman that he loves and say, there's the line, don't cross it? So yes, it was, it was a surprise. Um, but I think a lot of people out there thought good on him. The letter seemed to have had the desired effect as the couple's love blossomed, mostly away from the public eye. The couple had been snapped in an unofficial capacity, having a quick kiss at a polo match, out in London going to the theatre. But everyone was ready to see them step out. I think people were waiting for that official moment. And we didn't have to wait long, as in September 2017, the couple made their first official public appearance at the Toronto Invictus Games. It was just a really wonderful moment. They looked really relaxed together, wearing jeans. She was wearing ripped jeans, you know, something you don't, again, see on a royal engagement, usually. Just those small details of intimacy and the way that they behaved around each other and um, the way they looked at each other. I think, you know, I'm romantic, I like love. Both in and out of the spotlight, the couple announced their engagement. It's an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> there was a lot of touching. She was, like, stroking him. She was gazing into his eyes. They showed how much, you know, they care about each other. They showed vulnerability. It's really nice to see. Um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us, and um, I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. This is Harry and Meghan doing the royal stuff their way. For me, I saw a very modern couple. When the couple made their first official royal appearance in Nottingham to mark World AIDS Day, it was clear the public was falling in love with Meghan, too. For the first time in his life, Harry has got a girlfriend who won't blame him when she is in the spotlight. You can see the smile on his face, you know, one of complete and total adoration, saying, God, I've, I've got the right person here. I think Meghan comes with fairy dust. She's used to cameras, she's used to talking to people, to being a star. Meghan will join Harry in causes close to his heart, including the Heads Together charity set up with William and Kate, dedicated to helping people like the young prince who have struggled with mental health problems. Who's not going to listen to a prince saying, oh, I've, got, I've had a problem, and now I'm going to talk about it? Everyone's going to listen. For Harry to step out and admit to the turmoil and admit how he has struggled in a mental health capacity, to see a member of the royal family laid bare like that had really never been done before. On May the 19th, when Harry and Meghan tie the knot at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle, it will signal an end to an extraordinary emotional journey. When Charles married Lady Diana Spencer, member of the aristocracy, it was still part of the club. I think the marriage of Charles and Camilla, in fact, opened the door for William and Harry to marry whoever they wanted. When William married Kate, it was a completely different thing, marrying a girl from the middle classes. And now it's going a stage further. Harry then marrying Meghan, a divorcee, an American, mixed race origin, an actress, all of which things would once have been unthinkable.
whole demeanour has changed since he's been with Megan, and you can see that excitedness in him. And uh, it'll be lovely to see him on the wedding day and seeing that little face bright, you know. And he'll take one look up. I can guarantee he'll look up, and that'll be, I'm done it, Mum. And that's why he stuck his tongue out. And he did it fairly regularly. He thought it was very funny. And that mischievous streak was just as evident at home. Harry was four when I started cooking for the family, and 15 when I left. And uh, I have very vivid memories of being in the kitchen at Kensington Palace. I remember hearing very fast scampering children's footsteps as Harry tore up the landing and then flew down the stairs towards the kitchen. And uh, on more than one occasion, Harry was trying to escape from his nanny. Quick, help, help, I need to hide. 
So there were some low down cupboards, so it was very quick to scoop Harry in and, and close the door. Um, he didn't always give himself away with his giggles. He was a prankster. Um, you know, he was a joker, just a bit like his mother, really. Diana would always play with the children. She would be on her hands and knees playing piggybacks and cuddling William and Harry, and it was just wonderful times. I remember one particular day running a bath, and I went back to my office room and came back, and there's this bath now bright red. And I think, Christ, you know, what is this? And of course, Harry had, had seen me running a bath, gone down to the kitchen, asked the chef, Ken's having a bath, have you got anything I put in the bath? Well, you know, the chefs are very much into this game as well, so they give Harry a, a bottle of red cochineal. And of course, he empties the whole contents into the bath. It was then his mother comes out and finds all this. And that's what it was. It was great fun. I remember particularly weekends at Highgrove, and um, there was quite a lot of rough and tumble, and I think Prince Charles and the boys definitely enjoyed the odd pillow fight and a good bit of rough and tumble. 